Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Bernoun. You're watching Israeli News Live, still here with Dr. Steve Pidgeon and uh, with the SFR uh, Publishing Group. Incredible work that is. Do definitely go and check that out on, on uh, the website there. Sefer.net, that's C-E-P-H-E-R.net. Uh, and definitely you want to include that in your biblical studies for your research tool for a Bible period. I don't like using the word Bible. Sacred scriptures is a better way to put that. Uh, but for those of you that may not understand what I'm trying to say, say it that way. Uh, Ed Sefer being the book, uh, it is a compilation of the sacred scriptures, including all of the canon that you have today, plus some of those books that were removed over the years. Uh, so definitely check out the website there. Order your copy if you'd like to get a discount on that, as well as uh, be a blessing for Israeli News Live. Include uh, promotion code INL for Israeli News Live. And we were uh, we left off with uh, Dr. Pigeon yesterday speaking about Russia, how Russia uh, was not only are they a Christian nation, uh, have been and went through 70 years of no a famine, we would say, uh, but as well. The, the descendants of Manasseh, uh, the tribe of Manasseh. Very interesting insights that Dr. Pigeon has shared with us there. Uh, Ephraim being the, the, uh, the British Empire, and of course the United States being one of those colonies of the British Empire. You may not believe that, but I think some of our history has been falsified. Uh, it looks like we still are a colony of the British Empire. Anyway, very interesting things we're seeing, and we're going to be getting into more of the biblical application in this broadcast today. Uh, going into where are we at? What's happening? Why are we sitting there warring against one another? Dr. Pigeon, thank you. Welcome back. And let's continue on where you left off. You bet. I'm glad to be with you again, Stephen, on this important topic. Now, you raised an interesting point here. Is the United States still colonized by Britain? You know, is Kenya still part of the British colonies, right? Is Canada still Lincoln? Is Australia? Well, you know, the Queen controls 53 votes at the United Nations, 53 votes. Wow. And there's some very interesting agreements back there. If you go back and research history, you'll find that there's an interesting agreement between the crown, and that would be the British crown, and the Pope that occurred during the reign of Elizabeth I. Now, Elizabeth I had her own problems. She was being advised by a demonologist, John Dee. And this is where child sacrifice to drinking of blood first began. But... You had this whole idea of the crown of, at that time was the military arm of the Vatican. So the Vatican, the Vatican did something very, uh, very um, inconspicuous. You had the idea of Rome and the Caesars. Now the Caesars all proclaimed themselves to be God, including Constantine, including Constantine. They say Constantine converted to Christianity. Yeah, he did. He converted on his deathbed because he came down with sickness unto death on Easter day and died on Shavuot. And between those two periods of time, he had converted to Christianity. But before then, he had exalted himself as a god all over the Roman Empire and had established the capital of Rome in Constantinople, which is due north of Jerusalem. Due north. Okay. So... With, the, with Constantine, with the, so when the, when the Pope says we have apostolic succession and then they create all of these documents that are Gnostic, Gnostic, Gnostic documents and, you know, third, fourth, fifth century, sometimes seventh century documents to try to claim that Paul died in Rome, which he didn't, to try to claim that Peter died in Rome, which he didn't. Peter died in Babylon. I mean, that's what it says in Second Peter. He never went to Rome. You had somebody else who went to Rome. And they took the statues of Jupiter and then they said these were now the statues of Peter. The apostolic succession that the Catholic Church truly has is Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Nero, Hadrian, you know, Titus. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of Caesars. These were the successors, the prior, the, the predecessors to the popes in the Vatican. But after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, these Romans figured out, well, we can still maintain Roman power by doing it spiritually and delegating the military authority to these people who want to burn Rome. And they did it, and they proved it when they excommunicated the king of the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman. It was a German empire. And they excommunicated that king, and he had to come to the Vatican 
on his knees in the middle of winter to receive repentance or he could not run his country because they had established their control over the grassroots of the country. Now, you know, living there in Prague, that, you know, the history of Prague includes the burning of Jan Hess in Wenceslas Square and the killing of the 40,000 Protestants whose bones sit in the Church of Bones. Exactly. Right? And there was another, there was a slaughter of 30,000 Huguenots who were followers of John Calvin in France. They couldn't get the Calvin in Geneva, so they killed his followers in France. Lock, stock, and barrel. You had a similar slaughter in Britain of the Catholics slaughtering and slaughtering and slaughtering until Henry VIII needed a divorce. Then that kind of thing turned into a civil war in Great Britain. But when that happened, Queen Elizabeth I got excommunicated. But this was no problem for the Pope because he could enter into an agreement with Elizabeth I to make her the military arm of the Vatican, because after all, it's Ephraim who's going to become a great company of nations. And so he enters into this agreement with Ephraim for them to become the military might. Well, Britain could not hold on to it because Britain figured out like an ancient, like an, uh, an elderly homeowner, kind of like me, you figure out, well, look, if I have an intruder come through the door, I'm probably not going to be able to handle it. But this bull mastiff right here can handle it. Or this Doberman <laughs> pincer or this, right? So they wanted to create a bull mastiff. And so they created the bull mastiff in the United States. And so people think, well, we fought a revolutionary war. We became an independent country, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you how we fought the revolution. We borrowed the money from King George to fight King George. The French borrowed the money from King George to ally with us to fight King George. So at the end of the revolution, did we burn London and kill the king? No, we struck a deal. We struck a deal at Yorktown. We won the battle, not the war, and then we struck a deal. And so what was the deal we struck? Well, we owed the king $43 million in 1776. Now that's back in the day when a dollar, you know, would be equivalent of about 400 bucks now, right? And we owed them 43 million. And the king said, yeah, okay, well, look, you guys have asserted your independence there. So why don't you sign this little contract, this little prom note right here in 1783, obligating you to pay back the 43 million at 30% interest. Now, Never you can get out not, of debt at that rate. <laughs> right, right. 30% interest. I mean, you know, and that's compounded continuously, right? So, what you see is that that debt just kept building and building and building and building. It never went away. And then you have this British East Indies company that has been given the flex to go out there and be immersed. You know, they were the ISIS of the day. They were over there, you know, making all kinds of trouble in India and in North America. And the trouble they made in North America was what? The Civil War. It was a Jesuit inspired op because what was happening in the United States in 1776 Christmas was illegal in the United States. It was banned. That's why George Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas Day, because the British were celebrating it and the Americans were not. The Catholics could not get a hold in Protestant America, could not get in. And the crown was using us as their bull mastiff, as their Rottweiler. We, that's who we were. That's who we are. We're the Rottweiler. And so what you see is that the Vatican wanted in, wanted in, wanted in, wanted in. If you recall when John F. Kennedy was elected president, do you remember how scandalous it was that he was Catholic? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, it was like the first Catholic president unheard of in the United States. Who's ever heard of that? Because, of course, they were outlawed by the colonies. And But the Catholic Church now asserts its dominance and its political control over an area by putting up its twin tower church right over the downtown, right over the seat of government. And those twin towers stand for Romulus and Remus, right? Rome. Rome controls here. And the signal is you politicians may control the governance, the bureaucrats, the tax money, and so on and so forth, but we control the people. And how do we know we control the people? We force them to worship on Sunday. We force them to keep Easter and Christmas. This is how we know that Rome controls you. That's so, exactly right. So your spiritual citizenship, if you are a Sunday churchgoer who practices Christmas and Easter, your spiritual citizenship is in Rome. It's in Rome. 
Okay, so what you end up with is a tripartite relationship. The Vatican running spiritual matters, the crown running financial matters, and the United States running military matters. And so we have been used as the, the, the bull mastiff. Okay, hey, we're getting in this bat with our cousin over there in Germany, World War I. And these Germans are pretty good. They're beating this up. Bring in the bull mastiff. So we show up for the war, which we did in World War II, too. Same thing. Well, the bull mastiff shows up, right? But where does this leave us as Ephraim versus Manasseh? Well, here you have the Western church having very little information about the Eastern church. Remember that Russia, until the Soviet Union, was on the Julian calendar. They weren't on the Gregorian calendar. They were on the Julian calendar. They had different New Year. They had different dates. Their whole calendar system was different. And people would have to adjust to that because the Russians will tell you that they have received the mantle, if you will, from Byzantium. And so Byzantium, which fell in 1453, that was Constantinople. That was the seat of Eastern Orthodoxy. That's right. And the East and so the Eastern Orthodoxy included Alexandria, it included Antioch, it included Cappadocia, you know, it included all of those locations. In fact, the Byzantine Empire at one time stretched all across Northern Africa and all throughout the Middle East. A very powerful seat of Orthodoxy. And the Orthodox practice, even today, now there's been some corruption. There's been some Catholic corruption inside of Orthodoxy. Otherwise, the practices are similar to what it was in the first century. So you go into an Orthodox church, you know, they have the icons up. And you say, well, I'm opposed to icons. But, you know, a lot of those icons are for a population who can't read. They can't read. So they put up a picture so you can see. This is Mashiach on the cross. This is, you know, the apostles gathering. This is the resurrection, right? And they can see, they can visualize what's going on when they can't read the text. But even today, you go into an Orthodox church, everybody looks in the same direction. They all pray to the holies of holies, they have a holy of holies. And when they read the gospel, they read the gospel from the holy of holies. When they sanctify the bread and the wine, they sanctify it in the holy of holies. All of this stuff goes on in Orthodoxy, and it's there's no chairs, you stand, right? So the traditions of Orthodoxy uh, are not inconsistent with Christian practices. In fact, they represent the practices that were taking place in Jerusalem under Marcus, in Alexandria, uh, so on and so forth. Those were the practices that were going on by the second century AD. Is it consistent with what Mashiach was doing in the first century? No, it's not. Because it was even simpler, even simpler, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light, right? Yes. So what you see here is this restoration. So this last king, the last emperor of Byzantium, his daughter marries the Russian czar. And this crown is passed from Eastern Rome, which is what Byzantium was. Eastern Rome was passed to Russia. And Russia considered themselves, and still does, to be the ultimate defender of the Christian faith in the world. I did not know that. That is interesting. Even though the Queen of England when she took her office, the most recent queen, Queen Elizabeth, she took an oath as the defender of the Christian faith in Britain. And all of those deals of, you know, sitting over, over the, uh, of the stone of uh, the stone of scone, you know, Jeremiah's pillow. Right. And all the things, all these traditions that are common in Britain are common because of the Christian faith. And the queen or the king has an obligation by oath to defend the Christian faith. But in Russia, they consider themselves the top defenders. And now that brings us, though, Steve, to the very point that we're dealing with today. Why then is there so much Russia phobia? Why is it that, especially in light of the fact that President Putin has once again tried to uh, bring that attention to the defending of, of the Christian faith? And, and I say defending the Christian faith because his Entering into Syria, he stated publicly that he wanted to protect the Christian uh, believers that were in Syria and has also vowed to rebuild all the churches in Syria uh, after the war here. So why do we have this animosity being brewed in the United States by the Democratic Party for the most part against the, the, the people of Russia? 
you know? All right, well, let's talk. The Democratic Party declared themselves to be under another God in 2012. At the Democrat National Convention, they mentioned God and the whole place booed. Jeez. The whole place booed, okay? This time around, these women got up and were exalting their abortions. They were talking about their spirit cooking. They went on and on and on and on as in regard to the God they worship, which you and I would immediately recognize as Moloch, Milcom, Baal. That's who they worship. That is their God. There's no question. And so they preserve what we now discover to be a very significant uh, abomination as a lifestyle. I mean, you're, when you're talking about, uh, you know, sexual molestation of children and child sacrifice for purposes of drinking the blood, for purposes of satanic ritual, child maiming uh, for purposes of satanic ritual, uh, spirit cooking, uh, you know, abortion uh, one minute before the baby is born and then selling the baby's parts on a, on a, on a flesh market. Right. And they're, they're proud of all of this. They, they love this. And then they advance the LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ agenda. And, you know, when the, when the Supreme Court in the United States said, you know, let's, we're going to, we're going to legalize same sex marriage. Actually, we're going to codify the state's ability to license marriage between people of the same sex. Then they said, we're preserving, we're preserving this right for seven other kinds of sexual expression. All right. Well, when, when they when they took the act first, they preserved LGBT, right? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. What are the other seven? What are the other seven practices? What are they? How about, you know, forcible rape, like you see in the Islamic world, where it's legitimate to a rape an infidel? How about bestiality? How about pedophilia? How about necrophilia? I mean, what are the, bestial, what are they leaving out? That, that, that was just four. I didn't get to the other three. I don't know what the other three are. But they want to protect another seven forms of deviancy. So this, so, they, so this is the church of the Democratic Party. So do they hate Christians? They hate yeah. them with a passion. They think that we who have the faith of Mashiach are stupid, irrational people. And if we teach the faith to our children, we're child abusers whose children need to be taken away and placed into a home where a same-sex couple can determine whether or not your child needs a sex change operation at six or seven or eight years old. So this is where it has come to. And, and, and this is why the, the rage of Donald Trump becoming president of the United States, because their fear is that the nation could actually become a Christian nation once again, and they do not want to see this happen. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, exactly it's coming down to this, Steve, when we look at this scripturally, and we have talked about this extensively, when we look at Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 9, of course, the famed biblical passage about the, uh, the coming of the Messiah. But when we go further into that and go into Isaiah chapter 10, we find out a very interesting thing that happens in this last day. And that is that, blindedly so, Ephraim and Manasseh are at odds with one another, and they both are at odds with Judah. And, and all of it really comes down to, though, Steve, is that the, they, they don't realize who they really are. And this is why, like having you on our program today, this is what enlightens us to the historical value of who the United States really is, who Russia really is, uh, and, and from yesterday's broadcast as well, showing the movement of the tribe of Manasseh, showing that movement, the tribe of Ephraim, and through the two different kingdoms right here on the earth today, and of course, modern day Israel being the, the, the house of Judah has once again returned home. Uh, so I'd like to take, just quickly using uh, uh, memory machanon, and when you get down, and just to kind of for saving time, I'll just read just a little bit here, but when you go down to say verse 18 of chapter uh, nine of Isaiah, it says, through the wrath of uh, the Lord of hosts is the land burnt up. That's Yahuwah, by the way, 
uh, when we use the word Lord, capital L-O-R-D there. Uh, but the people also are as the fuel of fire. No man spareth his brother, and one snatcheth on the arm, on the right hand, and is hungry, and he eateth on the left hand, and is not satisfied. They eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Now, we're not talking about cannibalism either, friends. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together against uh, Yehuda, Judah, that is. For all this, his anger, anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. In other words, our Heavenly Father doesn't want this to happen, but we in, inadvertently are destroying one another. Steve, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, it's a horrible situation because I do believe this is divinely appointed. And the reason I say that <clears throat> is because it seems that the United States cannot stop itself. You know, we have this fueling of North Korea and the fueling of North Korea happened by the Clintons, by Bush, by Obama, they pandered to him. They actually gave him the nuclear materials. They gave him the nuclear technology. It was the U.S. that gave it to him. It wasn't Iran. It wasn't Russia. It wasn't China. It was us. We gave them the technology that they're now aiming at us. Yes. We, it was, you know, it was the Clintons who sold our missile technology to China. It was the missile technology that belonged to the United States nuclear technology that belonged to the United States, the Clintons sold it to China and put the money in their own bank account. You know, I mean, how sweet it is, right? Exactly. You, and know, then it, uh, that, uh, you, you bring this up with China, Stephen. That's one of the things I was uh, sharing with the people just the other day. And that is, you know, China has the United States to thank for becoming a superpower. So if we are so fearful of how great China is becoming militarily, and technologically advanced in the world, we have given them that ability, even economically a powerhouse in the world. Because what did we do? We sent all of our, well, good businesses, manufacturing companies all went to China and we, we have lined the pockets of the Chinese government. Uh, and, and I say the Chinese government because it definitely wasn't the poor Chinese people that were working for the poverty wages there. Uh, so we have lined this nation. They in turn have built a powerhouse of a military and they're pumping out aircraft carriers and now putting the Chinese yuan as uh, the, uh, the petrodollar being replaced, I should say. And slowly but surely the demise of the United States is, is going down because of that. And as you mentioned as well, North Korea. So we have nothing to do but to thank the U.S. Uh, people, uh, U.S. businessmen, and of course, uh, President uh, Clinton and others as well that have contributed to this. Oh, yeah. And it was a contributing Congress, all of whom were paying attention to their paymasters, who were the corporations. You know, they're not listening to the people that elected them. They don't work for the American people. They haven't worked for the American people for years and years and years. They pander to the American people. But they go into back rooms to make deals to get the office. They're handpicked by upper echelon people in Washington, D.C., who select who's going to hold what office. They pander to those people. And then the corporations fund their campaign and then they get elected. Even if they have to rig the ballot, that's what they do in order to get elected. And then once they're elected, they serve their corporate masters. They don't give one iota about the American people or an American person's perspective or opinion. Not one little bit. No. So we could scream until we're blue in the face that Obama had never proved that he was an American citizen because he could never proffer a birth certificate. Simple as simple as a birth certificate. He couldn't put one out there. He put out a fake social security number, a forged draft registration card. I mean, the whole thing was just complete fraud. And the corporate media proceeded to call all Americans who raised the issue stupid birthers and on and on, ridicule, 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 while no one in law enforcement or in the U.S. Congress ever lifted one finger. Now, that same people, all mammon worshipers, and you know, when you look at this word mammon, right, you cannot worship Yah and mammon, the scripture right. says. That's well, right. what is mammon? People say that, well, that's money. Well, not really. It's wealth. It's not money. It's the worshiping of wealth. And people want to be wealthy. I mean, look, all these people that are running after Bitcoin right now, right? I've got to, you know, I want to mortgage my house 
and I want to put all that money into Bitcoin because John McAfee said it's going to go to a million. Well, until it gets to a million, you're going to put everything you have in there. And then when it crashes at $99,000 and goes to zero and stays there forever, you will have lost everything. And somebody you else will have gained lost. that wealth and you don't even know who it is. Right. And it's got what value? I mean, come on. It's a pyramid scheme. Let's call it what it is. OK. But in the meantime, when we talk about what is this motivation, the game that was going on with the Clintons was it's called pay to play. OK, so here's how it's going to go. We're the great American military. We've got this great American military machine. You want to buy some of our military machinery? Well, then you have to kick back some money to us. So I'm going to need 35 million from you, 20 million from you, 10 million from you, 100 million from you, blah, 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 blah. You either kick into the campaign fund or cruise missiles come into your capital city. We kill you and your grandchildren and your kids. See, this is what we did in Libya. See it? See what happened? Now, do you guys want to pay or do you want to play? Which one is it going to be? And so everybody anted up into the Clinton Foundation. Oh, well, not us. Here, we want to. And so when the money gets high enough, okay, we're going to sell you some weapons. We'll sell you this. We'll sell you that. We'll sell you the other thing. And if you're really good, we'll sell you private stuff that belongs to the United States government and put the money in our pocket, like Uranium One. So in Uranium One, the deal that was made with, with Senator Hillary Clinton sitting in Congress and her husband flying into Uzbekistan to make a deal with Frank Justra, the deal is made where they create a corporation in Canada that's owned by Justra. Justra acquires 20% of the uranium, that is the uranium we use for nuclear weapons and nuclear fuel. He acquires 20% of that on lands that are occupied by farmers like the Hammonds and the Bundys. And they say, look, we're gonna acquire this uranium. And then once the uranium is acquired, the Russian group arms buys that Canadian corporation and 145 million bucks goes as a donation from the company in Canada to the Clinton Foundation. Now that's the actual tracking. So when you're in this pay to play mode, in order to win this game, in order to stick people up for money privately, you have to threaten them with force, right? It's carrot and a stick, carrot and a stick. Well, look, if you don't pay us, then we're going to bring revolution to your country and overthrow your president and kill your people and start a revolution and maybe displace a million people and wreck all your cities and do all this. Otherwise, you need to pay us. Well, that's what's going on. That's what went on in Syria. This is what's going on in Iran right now. Although I mean, I don't agree with uh, the Ayatollah running the entire nation and no freedom of religion, period. But it's still, nonetheless, this is what's going on right now. It's a, it's a <laughs> as you call it, a a pay-to-play situation, and Iran is not playing. Yeah, Iran is not playing, and primarily because you've had a paradigmatic shift in geopolitical power worldwide. What's the shift? Well, you've seen Russia, who's the number one oil exporter in the world, uh, achieve a substantial amount of wealth. But you have to remember, here in this country, there was a lesson I learned when I was in Georgia. The Bush administration came over to Mikhail Saakashvili, and they said, you know, you need a road here from Belize down to Batumi. So let's do this. We'll give you a hundred million bucks, do some environmental studies and get this thing prepared. And then we'll come back and see if we can fund the road. hundred million bucks. Are you kidding? Saakashvili got a hundred million bucks, built a four lane road, repaved everything else in the, in the country and still had 50 million bucks left. They don't do environmental studies in Georgia. They blade and pave, right? <laughs> and then they got it done. To, there was no prevailing wage, no union labor, none of that, right? They just did it. And this is the same thing in Russia. So you can have a fraction of the military budget in Russia and still end up with this super high tech that they have. And by the way, right now, their air force is by far, by far outpacing the United States. And the SU-35, this, T, this T-55 or T-50 that they've launched, the fastest, most maneuverable plane ever built. And we've launched this corrupted program called the F-35, yes. which yes. is a horrible aircraft with kickbacks going in every direction. This is the deep state. So the deep state says we have to have war. We don't care who we kill and we don't care where we go to war. Foment something, get something going here, even if we have to put our own troops over there to kill our own people until we get a war going, because we need a bigger contract for more aircraft. We have to build more tanks. We have to build more Humvees. We got to get more people on the ground. We got to get all this technology going. And unless we have a war, there's no demand. We can't justify the 21 trillion bucks that's missing off our budget. That's we right. That's why right war. now we've got North Korea, 
Iran and Ukraine, Russia, really, when it comes down to the end of the day, all, I mean, they're willing to risk it all and even take on Russia just to do something to keep this powerhouse that they've got going, going, uh, to move them forward, Steve. And, and that's, what's, that's what's very nerve wracking. And with China threatening, uh, not just threatening, but already making the, the move to repay, replace the petrodollar, uh, Russia and several other nations, even Pakistan, recently agreeing to go along with uh, trading in the, the Chinese yuan instead. That's putting the dollar at a major risk. That puts these elite, this Illuminati group, uh, this this huge um, a deep state, the, the military industrial complex on edge. So they're going to do something and they're going to do it quick. And that's going to be whether Trump likes it or not, he's either going to play ball or else. And I think this is one reason why they chose North Korea, because President Trump looks at North Korea as a legitimate threat. And it is, there's no doubt about it, it is definitely a legitimate threat. But at the cost of what? This is where it really well, comes down to the end of the day. Let's review that for a second. In the last Korean War, we killed 9 million North Koreans. Hmm. Does that number get published in the New York Times? No. no. But we proceeded to smoke to the, earth, to the ground. We burned every village to the ground and killed 9 million people in North Korea. So the North Koreans are going, okay, well, what's coming next? Well, there are very few people that really care about the Korean people at all. The Chinese don't like him. The Japanese don't like him. And what you see here is you're going to see a play. And I think what takes place here is that there'll be an immediate destruction of the entire North Korean regime and its ability to wage war. That'll take place in a very short period of time. Then the next question is, who is going to take North Korea? Will it be South Korea? Will it be Japan? Will it be China or Russia? Now, I personally believe that China and Russia are both posed to divvy up portions of North Korea. Russia is going to move in to the next major river and China is going to move down to the DMC. Maybe South Korea can punch up a little bit along the along the northern uh, coast there uh, to capture one of the bays and, and expand one of its ports to give it a little bit more room for Seoul. But what you're talking about here is North Korea will be divided up and this will take place in a very short period of time. China and Russia are putting their anti-missile systems there just in case you get some rogue guy who says, yeah, we're going to launch, you know, you, you launch a missile at North Korea, right? So the missile comes up and then it comes down. Well, is it going to come down there in North Korea or is it coming down in Vladivostok or is it coming down in Beijing? Right. Right. And so they can't afford to have those kinds of things flying around. Right. And there's there's no trusting anybody in war. You have to prepare for the worst. and You have to prepare for the infinite surprise attack. You don't know what that's going to be. So that's a lot of what's happening. Now, this buildup of armament and so forth in Europe is just absolutely crazy. This Ukrainian regime is not a legitimate regime. I think you and I can agree on that. Absolutely. Yanukovych was the true uh, elected leader. And of course, Rome got bent out of shape because he was not willing to go along with NATO. He wanted to get, he wanted to save his own people some money. Let's get our gas from Russia where we've been getting it from the entire time to start with. I know that's just one of the big issues. He did want to become part of NATO, uh, but you know, that's, that's a quagmire of a mess to begin with there. And, uh, and that is Rome pushing their own influence, just like it was with the Vietnam War. It was a Roman war. It was a Vatican-influenced war from the very beginning. And most people have no idea about this, Steve. No idea. And we're going to see the same thing. They still, the, the Rome still wants Russia conquered so that the uh, Eastern Russian Orthodox Church comes under their authority. And that's, at the end of the day, what they want. And they're willing to sacrifice all a semblance of decency and civilization to get there. They're willing to ride through 70 years of atheism. They're willing to ride through 70 years of anarchy, whatever it takes in order to flatten whatever is there. And they're doing the same thing here in the United States. If you look at the situation here, we have three Western states here, California, Oregon, and Washington, that are all Jesuit control. Okay, it's complete Jesuit control. Now, you would think that the Catholic Church, which preaches marriage, you know, anti-abortion doctrine, so forth and so on, you would think that they would support those traditional values, but they don't. They support the most crazy deviancy you can imagine, to the point now that in California, you can go to jail for a year 
for using the wrong gender reference to somebody. If the person ha- if the person is a guy and happens to believe he's a female that day and you refer to him as he or she or he or him, well, that's it. You can go to jail for a year, pay a $5,000 fine, just like that. So, you know, I mean, when you see that kind of that kind of crazy, absolutely irrational idiocy, the point is, is that they need to completely destroy that which is sacred. All of what you remember about America has to go away. Oh, we fought a civil war. No, we didn't. That was just somebody's fake news. Oh, we used to have a statue of Robert E. Lee right here. Oh, yeah. In your mind, we did. Nobody remembers that, right? Well, you know, Steve, we, we were bringing that out recently on Israeli News Live that the people are not watching what's really going on in the world. They're so caught up into this. And I have a passion for, for my black friends and stuff and what's happening to them when they, when they look at certain statues and it brings them back remembrance of the Civil War, regardless of what the Civil War was really fought about. But nonetheless, it's, it's offensive to them. I understand that. But they're not looking at what's going on across the entire globe. It is an, it's, it's an, a total annihilation of history, whether it be in the United States, whether it be in Europe, whether it be in South Africa, uh, whether it be in Syria with, you know, no, I don't want a statue uh, uh, of any uh, of, of Balaam's former idols and stuff, but nonetheless, ISIS is a military wing of the Vatican that they have used to destroy anything and everything to eradicate history so that they can rewrite it for this new generation coming. That's exactly right. And remember that what, he who controls history controls the future. So you completely eliminate the historic basis where no American can remember, oh, gee, we were a Protestant country that had abolished uh, Christmas that had outlawed Catholicism, that would never allow a Catholic to hold a major office in this country, all of that stuff, that stuff is completely gone. And the whole concept, you know, like for instance, people forget that Abe Lincoln was a Republican. He was the first Republican president. The Republicans were the ones that ended slavery. The Democrats opposed. The Democratic Supreme Court is the court that wrote the Dred Scott decision saying, oh, no, these slaves are chattel property. They're only two thirds human. It was the Democrats who imposed segregation in Plessy versus Ferguson. It was the Democrats who voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It was the Democrats in the South. And, you know, Steve, you're from Alabama. Come on. You know what went on at the Baptist churches over there on Friday night? You know, that's where the KKK met, right? Yes. And, you know, and so I mean, the, the, the reality was, is that it was this long standing tradition of intrinsic racism and pro slavery of position of the Democrats. Now, you talk to the average millennial, they think it was the Republicans that did all that. Exactly. Totally because they just write the history. history. That's exactly right. And it, and it happens in the schools all the time. So it's letting us know that something is changing. Something is coming in the very near future. And as and not just in the United States, you know, uh, e- even when I think about the United States, Steve, another thing that concerns me as well, look at all the 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 Protestant churches in this country, all going back to the mother Rome. She's taking over this country without firing a shot. Oh, yeah. And, and these are churches. I mean, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. I've been in those churches and hear those preachers rail about the Catholic Church. I mean, go on and on to, to the point, if you were a Catholic sitting in that room, your ears would burn off the side of your head. And I've heard other pastors in evangelical churches and in Protestant churches and in uh, you know Pentecostal churches and preaching the same thing. And now all of a sudden, you know, Kenneth Copeland is, oh yeah, let's go visit the Pope, you know, and uh, what's his name? The guy who wrote the, you know, uh, Warren, uh, uh, Rick, Rick Warren. Warren. Yeah, capitulating to the Catholic Church. Well, you know, capitulate if you want. But when you look at that audience room in the Vatican, that's the head of the serpent. I mean, you can't miss it. It's the head of the serpent. So you want to capitulate to the serpent? Capitulate to the serpent. You know, keep in mind that passage that in, in Scripture, it says, what father is it if his son asks for bread, you give him a stone? Right. Or if, if he asks for a fish, you give him the serpent. Well, who's getting the serpent? The people who have rejected the fish. That's right. And they're getting serpent. That's exactly and right. So, yeah. So here it is. So when you see this kind of stuff, 
this changing of history. Now you have this, you know, it's a very uh, a subtle tyranny that goes here on goes on here in the West Coast. But it is a tyranny. They do not allow for the expression you and I are having here in this video today. They don't allow it. I couldn't say this stuff in public in downtown Seattle. You can't even put a bumper sticker on your car that says, make America great. You take that downtown Seattle and park it, you'll have key scratches from one end of the vehicle to the other, maybe a broken windshield. Jeez. And it's, it's the time is coming soon, though, Steve, that we're not going to be able to speak like this, period. Nowhere in the United States. Uh, that is very close at hand. And uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned about that, very concerned about it. our f religious liberty, our freedom of speech is rapidly coming to a close. Uh, and, and it's just a matter of time. And, uh, and at the same time, and, as, soon, and as, that, as that comes to an end, this is where I'm concerned about with this, these wars that we're looking at, you know, uh, Yeshua is speaking of wars and rumors of wars. And then he says, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We are definitely, and he says, these are just the beginning of sorrows. Um, you know, and I, as I'm seeing, you know, we are willing to go out and war against our own, our own believing brothers and sisters, you know, and regardless, you know, w whether they have a different view uh, religiously, you know, like whether it be the Russian Orthodox, if you're a Baptist, you're a Pentecostals, uh, you know, whatever you might be, you might even be Catholic for all that matters. I don't hold against you because you're Catholic, you know, but it's the system is what is the danger, that system, because clearly God says, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins over in uh, Revelation 18, 4, I believe that is. And, and that lets us know that there are genuine believers caught up in that system. And he may even be referring to that as all these groups that are going and joining in there. You know, we need to be individual as believers of Yeshua. And we need to recognize that in this world today, regardless of what nationality tag is on your brother or your sister over there, you know, that's your brother or sister. How many stories have I heard, Stephen, you maybe as well, uh, of people that were in World War II. I heard so many times people tell me about they were moving into the enemy lines. They get up, they come there to a foxhole against the Germans and the Germans in there praying and reading their Bible. I've heard story after story of things like that. And they, they didn't have the heart to war because it was their brother. You know, they can't help that they were following Hitler. You know, they were, they were a soldier of Germany, you know, or other situations in other parts of the war uh, world and other wars, you know. The thing is, is Satan is the one that has caused us to turn against one another. And I think, as we've spoke about this before too, Steve, it is certainly there's others that are controlling the deep state in these countries. And I think it is certainly a return of the Nephilim. It is a return of that inbreeding of these fallen angels that are, that are in control, that are leading these nations in the direction they're going. And this is why we see the scriptures there in Isaiah uh, that are playing out, and uh, it, it's just really trub troubling. Well, there's dark spirits. I mean, when you think about it, there's an interesting um, collection of photos which shows George Bush, John McCain, uh, Hillary Clinton, Harry Reid, John Kerry, and they all have black eyes under their right eye. Now, I got to thinking about that, and I'm thinking, okay, so they're meeting with their boss, now, who's their boss? You think Jacob Rothschild has a strong right hook? No. David Rockefeller? No. Uh, how about Henry Kissinger? No. These guys are were, were walking corpses or are walking corpses. You know, how did these guys get these black eyes? Somebody who's got a powerful right is telling them what to do. You don't do this. You do that. Smack. And they end up with a black guy. Wow. That's interesting. And so, yeah, uh, so it's something to think about here because I keep looking at this. I keep looking at this. I keep looking at this. Thing, okay, who is this that would have the capability and the capacity to take these world leaders into a room and smack them? Who's got that capability? You know, when you, people want to talk about the Illuminati, the Illuminati is, a, is an aging dustbin, you know, the Bilderberg group. Yes. Again, it's a teaching dustbin. You know, the, 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 the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission. 
I mean, you know, I think it's a big new Brzezinski, if he's still living, it's older than dirt. You know, so who is doing this? It's some young man, some powerful being who can do this. And he's got both political power and physical power. And it isn't Pope Francis or Pope no. Benedict. No. Right? Okay. This is why it's a Melek Siphon. A hidden king is that king of the north. And as, as I was, uh, I don't know who I was speaking with. Uh, it was Paul Begley. Paul, I was on with Paul Begley the other day. And we were talking about the hidden king. And Paul Begley says, Steve, who is the king of the north? Because I took him over to, as we were talking about before the broadcast, Jeremiah chapter 10, showing him that Rome is the king of the north. I said, it's a Roman kingdom. He says, well, then is it Pope Francis? I said, he's only the spokesman. Right. He's not, I said, the king of the north is truly, as the word siphon can be used as the word north, but it's also the word hidden. That king, you do not know his identity because it is hidden from public view. All we see is the mouthpiece. Yeah. Now, this could lead us into a discussion of the serpent seed. Absolutely. And it could take us there because when you talk about the serpent seed, you know, there's an interesting passage, this whole thing that takes place in Judges 16 through 19, where these sons of Belial, the 600, end up hiding in a cave, claiming to be Benjamites. But I don't think they were. I think they were Danites. And at the end of the day, they're given virgins from Bashan. Well, who lived in Bashan? Og lived in Bashan. There was still Nephilim seed in Bashan. Jeez. And so it says that Dan shall leap from Bashan. Well, if you look at that, that isn't Western Dan that's over there in Yafo. That is Dan that's up in, in the city of Dan, up there in the Golan. And that group that took that city and named it after Dan they had married into all of their wives were wives that were had come out of Bashan carrying Nephilim seed. So this seed of the serpent now has progressed throughout the world. Now, they are also undercover because, remember, they succeeded in disguising themselves as Benjamites in front of the whole of the house of Yasharel, including the house of Judah. They were, when they were hiding in the cave, hey, you know, we don't want to fight anymore. Well, that's after every man of Benjamin and every woman of Benjamin had been killed. We don't want to fight anymore. We want to treat it. Well, that's all that's left. Well, those weren't Benjamites. Now, there, there were still boys and girls left in the tribe of Benjamin, but right. those guys were not. They were the sons of Belial. They were the ones who raped the girl and that crime passed on to, to Benjamin, wrongfully passed on to Benjamin. This may explain then too, Steve, then why we see that Dan in the book of Revelation is not considered one of the tribes of Israel, but rather yeah. is replaced. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting that Dan finds that kind of replacement. And you see that what has happened is, and it says in Genesis 49, again, Yaakov blessing Dan. Dan is a serpent and an adder on the way. Dan is a serpent and an adder on the way. And so you see that this, this idea of the serpent seed being corrupted inside of Dan. Now, not all Dan is that way. And of course, whatever your seed may be, a confession of faith in the blood of Mashiach uh, moves your sins as far away from you as the east is from the west. Right, right. And which is the true house of Yasharel. And it, with, with that confession, you're in Yasharel. And I don't care what your seed was. But when you talk about this, this seed of the serpent, the seed of the serpent has its own life. And these atheists that rose up to overthrow Russia and to take down all the crosses off the Orthodox churches and turn them into movie theaters, who, by the way, was totally championed by the New York Times, by the American press, was funded by American bankers, the same bankers that are funding the deep state right now, same group. The same people that can't see. Well, if we get into a nuclear war with Russia, I mean, Russia, you know, they just test fired that Satan, too, right? Yes. And that Satan, too, has the capability. One missile takes out the whole state of Texas. Like seven and so, different warheads on this thing. Supersonic. Russia says the United States has nothing that can stop it. Yeah, that's right. Because what happens is this. The missile comes up, right? And the missile comes up. It's already supersonic. Now, I heard that it's doing something like Mach 7, Mach 8, something in that range. They're shooting for Mach 12. But then it starts its re-entry, and it starts its re-entry at that speed. Well, you have to have a missile that goes faster than Mach 7. And we don't. And we don't. Therefore, you can't hit it. 
And therefore, if that missile comes in, one missile takes out all of Texas. I mean, what happens if that missile hits over, let's say, you know, Albany, New York? And it takes out everything from Boston to D.C. You know, so, I mean, if they demonstrated, the Russians put up a map if they sent the Satan II over Britain, the entire United Kingdom would fry. It would even, the, 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 the blast radius would go into France. So, you know, I mean, the, and, 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 but these guys who are behind the military machine in America, one of the things, the premise, the first premise you have to accept when you get into this, the military industrial complex is we don't care who dies. And that's we care about problem. money. Yeah. We don't care who dies. And Russia, the opposite way. I mean, everything, and this is what I try to get to people to understand. You know, people say, oh, you're, you're, you're just a Russian conspirator. You're a Russian supporter. No, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a supporter of humanity. I'm a supporter of uh, trying to bring peace in this world, you know, or at least to, to bring the, the knowledge to people so that they can understand what we're dealing with. And President Putin over and over is trying to find a way to have peace with the United States. And he's very, but he's very clear too, you know, respect our uh, national interest as well. That's the only thing he's asking. Respect our national interest. But the deep state will not do it. Trump goes in there, talks to him. They're about ready to make peace. Then Trump goes into the back room. Somebody snatches his chain and lets him know you shouldn't have said that. And he has to kind of backtrack when he goes back. Who's What threat is this poor man under that he has to backtrack after what he says to President Putin? So we, we, that shows right there, Steve, that somebody else is running this country. Well, like I say, he is at war with the deep state. Yes. I mean, you just can't get around it. I mean, right now there's 10,000 sealed indictments. There have been hundreds of members of the FBI that have been arrested. They're gearing up Guantanamo Bay for thousands of prisoners. They have, uh, you know, the Marines did a beachhead really against the CIA to seize all their computers. He's got a Marine contingent in Washington, D.C. surrounding the White House. Now, for those Americans who don't understand this, this means that we are currently under martial law. Okay. All right, let's hit this real quick then, Steve, too, because that goes down to as well. John McCain, Hillary Clinton, both have broken ankles for some reason all of a sudden. I mean, come yeah, on. What are, they, what are they trying to hide? Has Hillary Clinton got this new uh, fashion now? Uh, yeah, they, they got the electronic home monitoring bracelet is what they're trying to hide. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, Chelsea Clinton's warehouse in London was raided. And what did they find? $400 million in cash that was supposed to go to Iran. Right. All housed in Chelsea Clinton's warehouse in London. Hey, wait a minute. Wasn't that supposed to go to Iran? You know, this whole Russia phobia thing is all of these people who had set themselves up to take bribes from Russia. You know, you pay my foundation. And then we maybe we won't bomb you. But in the meantime, we have to have a credible threat. We have to have a credible threat of terrorism in the North Caucasus. We have to have a terrible threat of terrorism in Ukraine. We have to have a terrible threat of an invasion over Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia's borders. We have to have all of that stuff going on all the time so that you are willing to cough up the bribe to us privately. And then we'll manipulate the, the war machine here so it gets off your back once you bribe us privately so that we maintain our power, our political power in the United States. I mean, that's the whole game. And so, yeah, once that's found out, you can say, look, you did that. That's self-dealing. That's what this whole executive order that Donald Trump signed on, on December 21st is. Most important piece of uh, executive action since Abe Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. It's the most important document signed by a president since then. And he said, look, we're going to root out corruption. If you have been dealing, if you're sitting in office and you've been dealing with state assets and you've been doing it in a corrupt way where you're getting kickbacks, bribes, et cetera, et cetera. You are now a national security risk. Yes. Yes. And, you know, Americans need to come out and support that because if Trump loses this battle. If he loses the battle, we're going down. There's yeah. no way of, no way around that, Steve. Right. That's true. And this is something, friends, you guys, you, uh, people, I know there's so many people that seem to hate President Trump to begin with. You know, listen, you really got to look at what's going on with there's a, right now. Everybody's calling it conspiracy theories. But John McCain and Hillary Clinton both break their legs, same leg at the same time and everything. 
We see the landing. We saw the news that came out about this when the, when the Marine Corps uh, came in. There is a battle going on, and it's for the survival of a true democracy of the United States, or at least what's left of it. And President Trump is not just fighting, he's not just fighting all these corrupt uh, Democrats that are in office there that have been doing all these bribes and kickbacks and everything else and, and global tyranny all over the world there. I mean, think about it. Go back. Look at what Hillary Clinton did. Look, look at this whole thing in Benghazi and things like that. That's another example of what this was going on. All right. This is just, you know, look at, look at uh, the, 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 uh, the sarin gas that was smuggled uh, out of, uh, uh, what was it, Libya, I believe it was, Steve, is that right? Is it Libya? And, and taken through Turkey into Syria and used against the Syrian people to be blamed on Bashar al-Assad while President uh, Barack Hussein Obama was in power to justify putting troops in there to get a war going there. All of these things, threats constantly back and forth. And here you finally get one president that comes along that's trying to change it all. You know, I hope he's successful, but I have a feeling he is fighting a battle and it's not just against American corrupt politicians and deep state that has got some uh, heavy hands in behind the scenes there. He's fighting a global battle and about probably the only person in the world that might would be able to help him. And that is probably President Putin. That's correct. And that's why that alliance, Stephen, is an extremely important one. Now, just for the record, I have no shoe in the game for Russia whatsoever, okay? I am a, a free market capitalist. I believe in a very limited government, free markets. I believe in what used to be American opportunity. I want to see it restored in this country, okay? As much as I love Russia and the Russian people, I'm not going to live in Russia. It's too cold and the food isn't good enough, okay? Just between I me agree. and you. I agree. <laughs> All right. So... But other than and, that, and Yana I mean, is not a Russian. There's so many people that write out there, oh, Steve married a Russian, and that's why he loves Russia. No, my wife grew up in the Soviet Union, despised communism with a passion, was beat in her school repeatedly because she was a believer in Yeshua, and that was not accepted there, uh, was put out of medical school because she would not convert to Catholicism. Uh, so she has hated Russia really hated Russia, I hate to say it, but she hated Russia because she looked at Russia as being the Soviet Union and communism. So when she had the opportunity to escape while there was communism and come to the United States, she did with $20 in her pocket and could barely speak anything in this language. And this is what she calls home. She's an American citizen and loves this country. And no, she doesn't want anything to do with Russia either. Uh, for me, it's just a passion because I know that there are believers there and I'm trying to watch who's doing the right thing in this world. So let's go back to this. We have an alliance with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia who are, was founded as a radical Wahhabist cult in order to separate it from the Ottoman Empire. And they have practiced radical Wahhabism uh, since they were formed. There's no such thing as feminist rights in Saudi Arabia. There's no Christian church in Saudi Arabia. There's no Jewish synagogue in Saudi Arabia. You can't bring a Bible into that country without being arrested. And if you're caught on the road to Mecca when you're not Muslim, Sunni Muslim in particular, you will be arrested. And when they arrest you, they take you downtown, they throw you into the cell next to everybody who was beheaded last Friday with their corpses hanging by their ankles next door on meat hooks. This is the group that we decided we need to be in alliance with. They're not the top oil producer in the world anymore. Russia is. Russia is also the top grain producer in the world. They are a resource-rich nation that would readily interface with the United States, and the Vatican and the Crown of London will not allow its bull mastiff to sit in a Russian Orthodox church. And they're non-GMO, Russia's non-GMO. They are totally against Monsanto and the, and the deviant uh, agenda that's going on there. And so, yeah, just, in fact, that's another interesting thing as well, Steve. Uh, Syria, 
was against GMO, refused to allow it to come into their country. Uh, Iran also, and I'm not a supporter of Iran because I don't like their threats to Israel, but nonetheless, they're against the GMO. Uh, there's all kinds of this stuff going on, Steve. I mean, everybody that is not for the uh, the agenda for destroying the, the, the people and, and on board with vaccines and glyphosate uh, and creating cancer and everything else for the, for the humans. Uh, and, and by the way, that, that's another thing. I'll just throw this in there real quick. It's a little bit off the side there. But my wife, when she came to this country, at that time she was not studying the natural health issue as, like she does now. And they were telling her she had to have the vaccines. Well, she got the vaccine with glyphosate that blocks vitamin D absorption. And by the way, that's one of the number one causers of cancers, of cancer, is that glyphosate that is in the vaccines. And she was just also, recently tested. Depression. Yeah, she was recently tested for that, Steve, as well. She struggles, and that's with vitamin D shots, to get her vitamin D even close to normal, and she's still nowhere near it. Right. Now, when you talk about those mandatory vaccines and the GMO, all that, the GMO stuff is Codex Elementarius, Nazi protocol. Yes. Pharmaceutical industries are all Fourth Reich institutions that are using Nazi protocols. I mean, you're talking about protocols where we hung the perpetrators of this in, at the Nuremberg trials in 1947 and declared them to be crimes against humanity. Any medical procedure that is done on another human being without their consent is a crime against humanity declared under the 1947 Nuremberg Code. And yet via Operation Paperclip and the importation of all these Nazis into the United States, we get nothing but Nazism from one end to the bur uh, of the burner to the other. Exactly. So what do we expect? And, that, and this is why Russia looks at GMO and they see the fascist swastika all over it. Yes, exactly. And that's exactly what it is. No wonder why Russia is so hated by this country. And then they bring all the propaganda into our media to demonize Russia and any other nation that doesn't go along with the agenda. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's on every level, whether it be your food, whether it be medicines, whether it be uh, war, politics, you name it. There is an agenda for the destruction of, my wife would say, the homo sapiens, period, just to kill the human beings, period. You know, it's, it's nothing but a genocide. Uh, and, and really, and that's the whole agenda. You know, just like they said, what was it, Prince Henry not long ago that said, there's too many people on the planet Earth. We've got to thin it out. I'm sure they got an idea, don't they? Yeah, well, Prince Philip said, if I could, I'd be reincarnated as a virus so I could kill every single human being on Earth. Jeez. And these are people, you know, and it, it makes you wonder what it is that they're thinking. But remember, Satan is a liar and a murderer. Yes. Right. He's a liar yes. and a murderer and an accuser. And so when you look at this, and we, like this coming AI, which we'll have to do another show on this, Steve, I'm going to have to come down there where you are. And we'll, we got to spend some time and just because, you know, let's just videotape what it is we're talking about and just go. That's and it. then we'll get some, then we'll get a professional in there to actually edit it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but. When you talk about when you talk about the rise of AI, we were talking about this this last night, era of Shabbat, you know, in the fellowship. We talk about the rise of AI. When you see these blockchains forming, these blockchains will have the capability in a very short period of time where a robot can immediately assume one hundred percent of your identity, wow. your bank cards, your you know your credit cards, your credit rating, your social security number, all of your personal history, everything your robot will be able to assume 100% of that. And the robot, they've they developed now some skin for a robot that is self-healing, right? This thing is 100 times more powerful than the robot that we saw in the movie Terminator. So each arm can lift a 1,000 pounds, right? So here you're talking about in just a few years, you're going to have a robot available that looks just like a human. 100,000 bucks, you get one, we'll give you 20-year financing at low, low interest rates. This robot can paint your house, do all your yard work, completely repair your car, tow your car, walk down there and tow your car home, do all of your housework and immediately control every 100% of your electronic devices in a flash of a second, speaking 365 languages fluently, right? One robot will be able to do all of this. 
And that same robot having access to blockchain, which is right now expressed as Bitcoin, will be able to access 100% of your identity. Now the next, when that happens, and all of this will happen in a nanosecond, when that happens, now the next question is, why are you the useless eater on this planet at all? Why would I as a corporate leader need you? Exactly. That's exactly right, Stephen. That's where we're headed to. That is exactly where we're headed to. And that's the whole purpose uh, for this. So, geez. Friends, we're going to have to wrap this up. There's so much we could get into. Steve, I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight. Uh, it's exciting, always exciting to have you uh, come on there. And, you know, I know you have a YouTube channel as well. Can you let the people know how they can go? Because I, I always get people asking me, does this guy actually teach somewhere as well? Let them know your <laughs> YouTube channel. Well, you know, I'm not as prolific as you are, you know, being you being my younger brother, Steve, you know, I'm not quite as prolific as you are. But, you know, we have the channel at Sefer Publishing Group on YouTube, Sefer Publishing Group. And I have some of my teaching there, but, you know, mostly I have blogs and uh, at the at Sefer.net, our website, uh, there's a blog section. I have my blog up there now and we're just introducing a new blog, uh, Sylvia Miller is now writing a Spanish blog for us because we're going to be introducing the Spanish version of the Ed Sefer probably in, hopefully in early fall of next year. We're very excited about that. Yes, and, that is exciting. But yeah, I have like 270, you know, they're not really blog, blogs, they're novellas, right? They're long discussions about what went on in the Ed Sefer. And it also discusses things like canonicity, it discusses things like uh, the historical background we're finding because we've transliterated the names, transliterate the names and you, you, you know, you mine the Hebrew, right? Some people are mining Bitcoin, we're mining the Hebrew and we also mine the Greek and what we find is incredible. And so we're oftentimes just jumping off the ceiling with joy about what we've discovered in the scripture and we want to share that. And so many of the blogs have that kind of information in it. That's, that's absolutely amazing. One other thing I want to uh, real quick reach out to the public here about. We did this one time, a long time ago. We ended up having several transcribers that helped us to transcribe some of the messages that we, uh, that we do. We are wanting to, again, to reach out to you guys that are listening. This broadcast here is one example, and I'm going to tell you why. We're looking for some people that can transcribe not all the messages that we do, but especially those insights that have the teaching aspect to it, or the, as we're dealing, talking with Steve today, what's going on geopolitically around the world, what the agenda is. Anytime it's, it's, it's coming back and comparing this with scripture. Now, here's why I want to tell you why. We got a message from a very dear friend uh, that lives in Beijing, China. As you guys know, communist nation cannot see YouTube, and or at least you're not going to see this channel in Beijing. But they have found an interesting way to be able to read the teachings that I've done, and I have been getting back amazing response. I cannot say who has told me about this, but they are believers. They have a... Uh, a, a big movement of believers there in China, and they're actually following the teaching segments of Israeli News Live. But we need to get more of that in the printed form, uploaded on the net. They're using uh, a way to get around the system in China so that they can learn more about the prophetic side of the things that are happening in this day. So if you're listening and you can do that, write us at IsraeliNewsLive at gmail.com. Uh, you can go to our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org as well. Uh, there is a place where you can send us an email. It really just all goes to the same place. So IsraeliNewsLive at gmail.com is the best way. Be patient with me. I get hundreds of emails a day. I wish it, it wasn't that many, but I do get that many daily. So I will have to really look for it. Put maybe in the description there, uh, transcribing. If you are able to do that and would like to be a part of that, we really do appreciate that. Uh, and don't forget, if you're interested in getting the Sefer, the sacred scripture is there. Please visit the website, Sefer, C E P H E R dot net. You'll see that on your screen here. And, uh, and be sure to put in the, the promotional code there, I N L. 
I'm Stephen Benone. Thank you, Dr. Pigeon, for joining us today. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been great. Oh, I, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this myself. I, I learned so much. Uh, you know, I mean, besides an attorney, historian, political analyst, I mean, you name it. You, you got it. I, I don't, where do you get the memory? That's why I never got the memory. My older brother got all the memory. <laughs>